It is January uh, 23rd of 2015, and we have uh, been looking at Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. We've seen him uh, go through Salamis, the uh, Isle of Paphos, Antioch, Pisidia, and then uh, in Antioch, Pisidia, he, Paul presented a beautiful 16-point sermon that was just perfect. And uh, then he went to Iconium. And uh, he did return to the uh, church, the mother church in Antioch, and gave his report. Now we're going to take a look at uh, the Gentile resolution, the resolution to the problem of the Gentiles, which had become a problem. Uh, you know, what... Uh, what can be absolutely determined as doctrine with regard to uh, their relationship to the Jewish faith, uh, or do they have immediate access to the Christian faith? It was a doctrinal question, so it was very important. And uh, we're going to look at uh, mainly Acts 15, and this is beautiful. I mean, this is Acts 15. I mean, each chapter to me is a surprise of, of what it has to offer, but chapter 15 if you want to know how Christianity became organized Christianity, well, this is how it happened. We're going to be looking at uh, the the uh, Jerusalem Council, where doctrine is determined in the first part of Acts 15. And then we're going to look at uh, the delivery of that doctrine out to the outlying churches through uh, mission efforts where actual uh, epistles or actual written doctrinal statements are actually uh, delivered and read and proclaimed in the churches. That's the method that uh, Luke is revealing to us here. So it's really a great picture. Acts 15 is just a great picture of uh, how things started to fall in place and how they began developing a very solid doctrinal base to the Christian faith. Where, and if they had disputes, how were those going to be decided? Very important chapter. Now we're going to look at 4 to 29. 4 to 29 is going to be the uh, Jerusalem Council. And then 1530 to 16.5 is going to be the uh, mission deliverance of that uh, Gentile resolution, of the, uh, the doctrine that was finally decided upon. So it's going to be in two parts. And we're going to begin with the uh, Gentile Resolution. We begin in 4 through 12, and we're going to get a testimony given here by Peter, Paul, and Barnabas. All three of them are going to give uh, evidence and testimony in Jerusalem. And so you've got uh, Paul and Barnabas testify to what God had done through them on their mission trip. And uh, the Greek translates... They declared the entire process of God's building up of the Gentiles. They testified to the entire process of God's building up of the Gentiles. So a very important testimony that they needed to offer. And of course, the question gets a strong opposition uh, because Luke says that the uh, there was a Pharisee branch of converted Pharisees that were very much... Uh, a Judaizer type group that uh, was still very strictly attached to their Pharisee heritage. And they said that in opposition to Paul and Barnabas's testimony, they said that uh, it's necessary to keep the law of Moses, including circumcision. So, but, but don't just jump to circumcision here. The first thing I said was it's necessary for Gentiles to keep the law of Moses. They must first uh, become disciples of the Mosaic Covenant, and then they can pass into Christianity. So that was a, a sect of uh, converted Pharisees that became Judaizers like that. They opposed Paul in Jerusalem. And so, of course, Peter's going to stand up. And Peter gives a five-point presentation of his opinion on the issue. It begins in verse 7, it goes 7 through 11. And... Uh, he says that God has determined that the Gentiles should hear the gospel and believe. 
they should uh, hear the word of the gospel and pistuo and have faith and believe. And Peter says, we understand this, epistemi, epistemi, we understand this and recognize this as God's intent because we were made aware of it. And he's referencing, uh, if you remember, Acts 10, 34 to 48. Uh, we witnessed it at the Gentile Pentecost in Cornelius' Remember Cornelius, the uh, centurion, in his house, they experienced the baptism of the Spirit. So he said, hey, we, we saw the verification of this, that God does desire as the word of the gospel go to the Gentiles and that they believe. They were given the Holy Spirit, and it was based on, and I love this, Peter says, what it was based on was cardia nostes, cardia nostes. It was based on God knows their hearts. What they are outwardly is not the issue. Peter says the issue is that God knows their hearts. If they are seeking after him and if they are uh, willing to be open toward the gospel, God knows their hearts and they receive the baptism of the Spirit because of cardia nostes, cardia nostes, knowing of the hearts of the Gentiles. And then in addition to this, we go back to Paul and Barnabas again after hearing Peter, they testify again, and they say, also, with us, there was the verification of uh, signs and wonders. There's uh, Luke's favorite term, the birth of the church came through the Holy Spirit. This is all about the Holy Spirit. And it's always it's always about uh, Samia Kai Tarada. Samia Kai Tarada is signs and wonders. How did the church start? It started through uh, the verification and the authentication of the church through the spirit of Samia Kai Tarada, signs and wonders. Now, in the King James, they translate it miracles and wonders, but it's really signs and wonders, and, I, and signs is much more powerful than miracles. Signs are, Jesus Christ was a sign of the kingdom. So signs and wonders is a, a better rendition. Samia Kai Tarada. And uh, the church is being explosively emerging on the scene through signs and, signs and wonders uh, brought to us through the Holy Spirit, through the dunamis, spiritual power, the dunamis, the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit brings us the validation of signs and wonders. So Paul and Barnabas say, hey, we saw verification through the signs and wonders uh, through all of our ministry. So we had uh, the initial Paul testimony, the uh, Peter follow-up testimony in five points. And then we had the uh, reaction again from Paul on signs and wonders. So there's been a pretty good uh, opposition to this uh, Pharisee sect of uh, converted Pharisees, Judaizers. And so we're ready for a decision. We're ready for some kind of a doctrinal conclusion. And we learn that in Jerusalem now that the chief elder is uh, James, the brother of Jesus. Now, in some commentaries, you can read this as James, the half-brother of Jesus, because they always say, well, he can't really be a full brother because Christ was born of the Father, so he's a half-brother. And I don't like to do that. It's his brother. It's, a, it's the brother of the Lord. It's James, the brother of Jesus. He is the uh, chief elder in Jerusalem now, so basically you've got uh, Paul and Barnabas, leading the church in Antioch, a very powerful church. You've got James, the brother of Jesus, leading the Jerusalem Council, and the uh, apostolic teaching is all being headed up by the chief elder, the senior member of James, the brother of Jesus. So in 13 to 22, we get a beautiful three-part announcement of the decision in three parts, and it is, uh, it's beautiful. I mean, James uh, was evidently very powerfully educated and uh, endowed with the Spirit. He begins by saying in verse four, 14 that Simon Peter testified that God has visited the nations, visited the outlying nations. This is important to uh, James because he's going to tie this in with uh, Old Testament prophecy. Is the Simon Peter testified that God has visited the nations? 
He has visited the Gentiles uh, to to choose them as a people for his name, to uh, Laos Onoma Autu, to uh, take them up as a people for his name, to separate them out as a people for his name. So Simon Peter says God has visited the Gentile nations. Now, here's where James comes in and just really lays it down in a black and white. He says, this, this was prophesied in Amos 9, 11, and 12. Uh, so here we are. We're back with, uh, we're into Amos now, nine, Amos 9, 11, and 12. And uh, in 11, we see the, uh, the prophetic message that God will rebuild and build up the tabernacle of David. And this means, essentially, it's the prophecy that all of the Zionistic Jewish believers believed is that Israel would be reestablished as a nation. That's what this is talking about, okay? I don't want to overly spiritualize it because we have to understand at first how it was understood then. And it was understood then as uh, the actual Israel, an actual uh, uh, raising up of Israel as a state, uh, as self-governed and not being oppressed. So in a 9-11, we get the God will rebuild and build up the tabernacle of David. In other words, Israel will be reconfirmed as the covenant people and delivered out of any oppression from the new Babylon, which is Rome. And then, uh, and he will make the way straight, according to this prophecy. Now in 9.12 of Amos, we hear that uh, the reason that God will rebuild the tabernacle of David is so that they will seek out the remnant of humanity. So they will call upon, so that this remnant of humanity will call upon the Lord. In other words, Israel will be rebuilt so they can be image bearers to the Gentiles. Here's where we get the whole flux and the whole intent of, of the book of Acts. Jesus Christ came uh, and ministered his ministry because Israel did not take up their true ministry of being image bearers of the grace and the glory of God to the outlying nations, and they needed to be taught that was the intent. And so here, James says, Amos prophesied that the tabernacle of David will be rebuilt and it will be made straight, but the reason in 9.12 is that so they will seek out the remnant, the literal translation, so they will seek out the remnant of humanity. They will call upon, so that this, the Gentile nations will call upon the Lord. Israel will be rebuilt so they can be image bearers to the Gentiles of God's grace and God's glory. Because glory is no longer to be concealed in a rock and mortar temple. It is to be carried out to the nations. And uh, there is a little bit of a comparison here that James alludes to uh, in uh, Exodus 3.16 where God visits Israel to liberate them from Egyptian captivity. He uses that, that concept of visiting. You know, visiting, God has visited the nations uh, as a comparison the way that, uh, that Israel was visited initially in its liberation out of Egypt. So it is a uh, very much telling the uh, these this Pharisee sect that the whole purpose behind the rebuilding of the Davidic tabernacle is so that we we will outreach to the outlying Gentile nations. We've got to get our heads around this new intent, this new understanding. We weren't supposed to take God and build a huge rock and mortar house for him and hide his glory behind a veil. We were to be image bearers and take the glory of God to the outlying nations. So beautiful, beautiful, uh, you know, foundational reference. He references uh, the prophet Amos, and he says, according to Amos 9, 11, and 12, God wants to visit the Gentile nations. And that's the whole reason that uh, Israel is being raised up and made straight again. And then... Uh, and his third and final point, I don't really see as a concession. 
the Judaizers probably saw it as a concession, but uh, James says we don't throw out all the law because the Gentiles should at least obey three basic elements. And they are to uh, abstain from contaminated things like uh, animals that uh, are strangled and not uh, bled out after they're killed. They're supposed to abstain from idolatry and they're supposed to abstain from sexual immorality. So you've got a three-point amendment to uh, this uh, visiting of the nations. And this three-point amendment uh, obviously would be uh, looked at as a at least a small victory for the Judaizers. But uh, James says, we don't not going to throw the whole law out here. Sexual immorality, idolatry, they need to be really taken up even within the new Christian uh, ethic. So James gives us a beautiful rendition of Amos and a beautiful rendition of what the tabernacle really is and what the temple really is. It's, uh, it's to be raised up for the furthest end of creation, the far ends of the earth. The temple is to be raised up and made straight to outreach to the Gentile nations, to all nations and all people. So in 23 to 29, we get uh, actual, the first instance uh, where we read in the book of Acts, where the church establishes written doctrine. Uh, they write this up as written doctrine, and then uh, Judas and Silas of the Jerusalem Fellowship join Paul and Barnabas, and they all return as a foursome back to Antioch with a, uh, a, a handwritten document of doctrine, an actual uh, graphos apostolos, an actual uh, written document of apostolic teaching, a graphos apostolos. Beautiful. There you go. That's, that's, so this is how we start looking at Christianity becoming stabilized and uh, building a solid base of doctrine. It happens through graphos apostolos, apostolic teaching that is actually written down, and then you circulate this written epistle to the outlying churches to uh, get a uniformity of doctrine. So now we've got uh, the four missionaries returning to the to Paul's uh, mother church now in Antioch. They've got their decision from the Jerusalem Council from James. And uh, in this latter part of 15 and the first five verses in 16, we're going to look at uh, how do you deliver apostolic teaching. We're going to see what goes on there. Okay, if we look at... Uh, 15, 30 through 35, five verses, we get Paul's five steps of delivering the apostolic teaching. And, of course, this is in Antioch, but it applies to any church. And verse 30, first it is delivered, it is offered up into its proper place. Uh, the content of the epistle is offered up to the congregation. 2, verse 31, it is received... Uh, as a hailing and a recognition of its exhortation. of the exhorta It's recognized as an exhortation of doctrine and received as an exhortation of doctrine. And then verse 32, uh, it is uh, presented, not simply as a written doc document, but it, it is uh, presented with a verbal exhortation of uh, conviction and persuasive motivational language in order to strengthen and mature the uh, listeners in the congregation. So there is a, 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 a persuasive uh, presentation or teaching, uh, verbal, actual verbal teaching coupled with conviction. And then 4 in verse 33, the doctrine becomes internalized by the congregation in its wholeness. In other words, all the separate parts come together for them in a whole, which is called peace, because peace means to join together. So once they once they reach the uh, the peace of internalizing this doctrine, 
they have put together, they have joined together all the elements of that which is being brought to them into a comprehensive whole. And the fi final step, which is very important, 34 and 35, we learned that uh, there was additional teaching of integrating this doctrine into the uh, overarching and sovereign doctrine of the uh, teaching concerning the uh, word of Christ's lordship. Remember, he has ascended to become Kyrios Lord, so all doctrine gets integrated into the sovereignty of Christ's lordship. So they did some follow-up teaching on a uh, so how does this fit in with the lordship of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ? How does this Gentile resolution fit in the overall lordship? And that's the fifth and final step. So it's delivered, it's received, it is uh, proclaimed as an exhortation of conviction, it's internalized as a wholeness, as a complete joined together and fit together whole, and then it is integrated into the overall sovereignty of Christ's lordship. Now, there is some dispute that gets mentioned here in 36 to 41 because we find out that uh, Paul didn't care very much for John Mark returning to Jerusalem on the, in the first mission trip. Remember, John Mark had gone back to Jerusalem and uh, Paul and Barnabas continued on their own together. Paul remembered this, and now they're getting ready to launch out on a second missionary trip. And uh, Paul says, I don't want to take John Mark. And Barnabas, who is uh, John Mark's uncle, Barnabas says, well, I, I think we need to take him. You know, let's take my nephew. What the heck? Let's take him. The division was so severe, it was that Paul said no, and Barnabas said yes, that there ended up being a split. And uh, John Mark and Barnabas, so you got the uncle and the nephew, they sailed to Cyprus, and Paul and Silas went to Syria. So there actually, we have actually see there was some disagreement in the early stages here of missionary work. And now we've got split teams. You've got uh, Uncle Barnabas and his nephew John Mark sailing to Cyprus. And now Paul is uh, teaming up with Silas who had uh, joined them from Jerusalem. Now Paul and Silas in a 16, 1 through 5 we get the first presentation from Luke of Christian dogma. It's actually, the Greek word is dogma, so it actually is the first instance of Christian dogma. And remember, dogma gets kind of a, dogma is kind of a dirty name because a lot of people don't like using that term because that means rigid, strong, fundamental truth, and it kind of like eliminates the uh, openness of doctrine. Uh, to revision. So dogma is, very, dogma is a very strong word, but that is what Luke is using here. He says that uh, Paul and Silas actually are joined by Timothy. Uh, Timothy um, joins them, and uh, they uh, take the apostolic teaching, but it passes through uh, a stage where it actually gets uh, abbreviated into dogma. So we had uh, the Jerusalem Council Definitely working up a uh, graphos apostolos, an actual written document of Christian doctrine. Then we had it uh, presented to the outlying churches through exhortation and conviction. We had it uh, measured and disputed for its balance of value. And uh, sometimes there were disagreements. And then uh, eventually it even gets abbreviated into uh, a more concise and a comprehensible dogma of actual uh, dogmatic doctrine. So uh, now we're kind of getting a picture here from Luke of how how does a uh, how do we develop that singular agreed upon Christian base about what it means to be a follower of the way? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a member of the Koinonia Fellowship? Well, this is how it happens. It happens through uh, apostolic teaching. And then apostolic teaching has to be written as a graphos apostolos, and then it has to be carried, has to be carried and presented with conviction uh, as 
teaching ministry, not just preaching ministry, but teaching ministry. And eventually, through dialogue, it can even be abbreviated as dogma. So chapter 15, very powerful. And that'll uh, fix us up for chapter 16 coming up next.